few quick housekeeping items. A recording of the panel will be shared later this week for those of you that couldn't join live. And aside from the panelists, all of the other attendees, you've been muted, but that's only to keep your work from home dog and your family companions from joining us in the conversation as well. We truly want you to participate. So both the chat and the Q&A functionality are turned on. So please make use of one or both and join us in the conversation. We'll be checking questions throughout the discussion. And so now that that's all out of the way, I'd love to introduce to you the other um, extraordinary women that are joining me for this conversation today. So we have first Michelle Wine. Michelle is the Director of Research and Regional Initiatives at the Workforce Intelligence Network. Hi, Michelle. Rachel Perchettes, Director of Education and Workforce Initiatives for the Detroit Regional CEO Group. Hi, Rachel. And Stacy Stevens, Senior Product Manager of Professional Development for SAE International. Good to see you, Stacey. Grand entrance, I love that. We're really amping up the Zoom uh, drama here. Uh, so let's jump into this. I am going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Uh, tell us a little bit about your work, your organization. And in doing so, I'd also love for you to take a stab at sharing how your organization defines mobility because I suspect that uh, while there are many things that we share in common there, there might be some important differences as well. So Michelle, I'm gonna ask you perhaps to start. Sure, um, well, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Michelle Wine and I am the Director of Research and Regional Initiatives for the Workforce Intelligence Network um, or WIN as we call ourselves. WIN is a small nonprofit operating in the metro Detroit area focused mainly on talent pipeline issues. As a part of my role within WIN, I actually facilitate an automotive um, consortium of sorts um, between OEMs and tier suppliers, as well as education, nonprofit, and government partners. And it's actually called the Michigan Alliance for Greater Mobility Advancement, or MAGMA. Um, and we've been operating now for about nine years. Um, actually, SAE is one of our members, and um, I spend a lot of time on the phone with Stacy, believe it or not. So um, I'm really excited to be on a panel with her as well. Um, but largely, we have um, 10 industry members and nine government education and nonprofit partners. And we really look to um, address skills gaps in the mobility area in southeastern Michigan, um, primarily as it relates to incumbent employees. Um, so people who are already working in the mobility sector, how do we think about upskilling them as the jobs are changing? Um, and what kind of education and training can we provide to them um, to sort of keep them working, but also get them the skills that they need? So. That's great. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Rachel, we'll have you jump in here. Tell us about the regional CEO group and your work. Absolutely. Um, hi, I'm Rachel Perchett. So I lead education and workforce initiatives for the CEO group. And this is a group, an informal collective of 16 of the CEOs from some of our largest regional businesses and some of the most sort of um, civically engaged. And this group had been meeting for about two years and recognized that um, economic or education and workforce development were two of kind of the primary focus areas and interests of the group. And that collectively businesses and philanthropy have investing huge amounts in both of those areas um, in Southeast Michigan. Yet we still had businesses that didn't have necessarily the talent that they need and plenty of residents that are under or unemployed. And so said, um, you know, what are other regions doing that are perhaps more competitive? What is the role that business is taking in those communities? And how might we think about implementing some of those best practices here? And so about a year ago, we um, began to look into some of those other regions and practices and found that um, in places where employers really take the lead and the whole work system is aligned around what employers needs are and is thinking about it as kind of a pull system where we're really focused on what are those gaps and what are those workforce needs that the rest of the system is able to work together and function better. And so we convened a group of employers and based on the um, makeup of our group, they're um, automotive employers to start to work on a pilot and say, what are the um, specific jobs we should be thinking about? Let's try to kind of put some of these best principles we've learned about into practice and focus on a particular role. Um, we're focusing on those that require less than a bachelor's degree, considering where some of the gaps are in our region and thinking about how we build um, working with other partners and agencies and initiatives 
how can we sort of tie some of those pieces together to better serve um, employer needs? That's great. Thanks, Rachel. And uh, in terms of mobility, mostly automotive or how do you think about the um, you know, we started with a group of automotive employers, and we originally had thought about also starting an IT group, but recognizing that so much of what the automotive employers had spoken to us about was IT, that we um, have sort of honed in on a few IT roles, but are also recognizing that some of those needs may cross-cut other industries, and given some of the you know cyclical nature of things in the region, are still thinking about how those might apply specifically in automotive roles, and then what are the things that are in common across other related or entirely unrelated businesses, you know, who else would benefit from defining these roles in a way that would serve automotive and um, the region. Got it. That's great. I'm uh, definitely sensing a theme. Yes, it's a biased panel, but very clearly the idea that it takes a village here, right? Uh, three collaboratives already. Uh, Stacy, would love to have you jump in to the conversation here. Tell us a little bit more about your work and again, SAE International, which I think a lot of people typically think of as standards in, in that working group. So where do you fit into, into that organization? Yeah, thank you so much, Jessica. So again, I'm Stacy. I, I work as the senior product manager um, in the professional development department at SAE. Uh, so as you mentioned, Jessica, a lot of people know us for our standards work, uh, which is of course incredibly important. Um, but we also have a professional development department where we offer training to um, engineers in the mobility space. Uh, in automotive, aerospace, uh, micro mobility, we basically cover it all. Uh, so I specifically oversee the ground vehicle section of our portfolio, as well as a section of the engineering tools and methods portfolio. So we have a, a vast, uh, vast options across the board, and I look forward to digging in today. Great, thanks. Again, a broad view of mobility. Um, Michelle, I actually want to come come back to you to, as we dig a little bit deeper. You mentioned Magma, and I know through the work that you do there, uh, the organization actually does a really excellent job at staying on top of current labor market trends and data. So I'm curious, maybe if you can help set the stage a little bit in terms of what, what you're seeing right now and what is the data telling us as it relates to the current state of jobs and mobility and what some of the opportunities for training might be. Yeah, um, so that's actually sort of my other role. Um, in addition to facilitating MAGMA, my role at WIN is uh, director of research. So I kind of have my hands, I guess, in both pots. Um, and one of the things that we always do when we have our quarterly advisory council meetings for MAGMA um, is we like to set the stage by talking about the state of the labor market. Um, and I can tell you that it's changed a little bit in the last year, um, certainly because of the pandemic. Um, the number of people who are working is obviously way down. Um, our, employment, our unemployment rate is up. Um, the labor force has shrunk just a little bit because people um, who may have been on the verge of retiring have probably taken those steps now um, for whatever reason. And so we're definitely seeing, I think, um, a lot of rapid changes. Um, you know, people have read the newspapers. They know that we've seen um, the, no the highest number of people filing unemployment since the Great Recession and actually above what we saw in the Great Recession. Um, it's come back down a little bit uh, since we've seen some reopenings, um, but it's still higher than it would have been had the pandemic not occurred. So I think some important takeaways from that, though, are that from what I understand in my conversations with our mobility partners in MAGMA, the, if there were layoffs that occurred, almost all of them are expected to eventually like make a comeback. Um, and so everybody's just trying to ramp themselves up in the best way possible and try to find opportunities to bring people back when it's appropriate. So there's this sort of perspective that a lot of the difficulty is temporary. Obviously that doesn't make it any easier for the individuals who are laid off. Um, but from the employer perspective, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of thought that this will be temporary. In mobility specifically, um, the conversations that I've had and the data that I spend a lot of time looking at sort of indicate that it was felt pretty harshly by the mobility companies. Um, I think as 
perhaps everybody that I'm talking with right now and hopefully all of our participants on the webinar are aware, it's not necessarily, especially if you're in a plan, it's not necessarily the easiest place to socially distance and continue to be an effective employee. So um, that's been one side of it. The other side of it is obviously there's been a, a little bit of a depressed demand from the consumer side for vehicles right now because other people who may not work in mobility are potentially laid off as well. Um, so it's kind of a, a unfortunately vicious circle, um, but I, I'm confident that we're gonna see a rebound, especially um, as the new technologies that are coming out of the mobility sector, whether it's connected and automated vehicles, electric vehicles, all of those things are still in demand um, as the world has been changing. And so I think we're gonna see it come back as the, we learn to manage the pandemic better as a society. That's really helpful. And I think one of the things we're watching closely is obviously there's a, a lot of talk about national politics right now, but everyone you know, continues to watch and wonder um, what an infrastructure package might look like and certainly what uh, incentives there might be that would drive further adoption of electric vehicles, which you know, I think we've been talking about here in the region for some now and you know, some time now perhaps this will be what you know, really starts to accelerate us into that next chapter. Um, I actually, Rachel, wanna ask you a follow-up question to that. When we spoke in advance of this panel, you mentioned that the CEO group, you're, you're kind of seeing that this is an opportunity right now for retooling as you know, people may be experiencing these um, temporary work reductions or job transitions. Um, can you talk more about that and, and how that's playing out within the companies that are part of the group? Absolutely. Um, when we started this process kind of pre-COVID, one of the um, issues we had in the talent and training space was that people you know, needed that talent now that we couldn't necessarily, um, not that we couldn't, we didn't have the appetite to invest in maybe a year long program or something um, that would bridge sort of that education level and skills gap. But now I think um, given that the work demand is not likely to be here for the short term future, there's renewed opportunities to think about some longer training programs, something that's a year, 18 months now might align really well with um, employees, employers being in a position to hire that wouldn't before. Um, and I think, you know, to your point, some of the federal politics, there might be training opportunities coming out of this that didn't exist in the past. And um, to increase our competitiveness, it's a real downtime, you know, that ability to retool people, whether it's um, upskilling workers or laid off workers, it gives us sort of a um, increased opportunity to think about making bigger leaps and bigger changes and pivots to our workforce to meet that changing demand. Can you talk at all about the, the types of areas that people might be uh, retooling themselves in right now? Yeah, uh, we have started, um, you know, we were looking specifically at that below bachelor's degree, but we're looking at a couple of roles that seem to have um, opportunity with our employers around industrial maintenance, uh, control systems engineering, cyber security, and software development. Um, and I will say we've you know, prioritized some of the software development cybersecurity roles, not, um, not as a statement on demand or need, but just because we're a small group and thinking about kind of our dynamics and which makes the most sense next. Um, but we do sort of recognize, you know, we've looked around at what training programs are out there and what uh, where people are currently training. And I think regardless of some of this fluctuation and regardless of um, the some of startling statistics Michelle shared, I think we recognize that all of those things will ultimately be in demand soon. There's a lot of uncertainty around the how soon and how many, but we, um, we could train a lot more people, I think, in those spaces before we would be concerned that we were overly training our regional workforce. Yeah. Stacy, I suspect you have something to say on this subject as well. What, what people are actually spending their time right now investing in? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, one of the things, interestingly enough, kind of pre-COVID that we had uncovered a, a huge need that we were able to see was the idea that with the new highly, um, newly hired engineers that came in, there was a gap between the theory of what they learned in school, right? And then the practical applications. Um, we heard a lot about how the onboarding could take up to, you know, eight to 10 months for those newly hired engineers. Um, and so that was something that um, I I'm sure will return, right? Once we're talking, once we get past this, I suppose. 
Um, and so out of that need, we actually created a, um, an AV systems boot camp, uh, which is a 12 week long virtual uh, boot camp. And essentially, we're in the pilot process right now, um, but we do plan to roll them out fully. Um, initially, two virtual offerings, likely um, one in March and one in July, um, and then the in-person offering in the fall of 2021. So, you know, as we mentioned, it was something, or as I mentioned, it, it was something that we heard a lot about um, that gap. And so, in creating that boot camp, we're really working towards closing that gap. That's great, and and I feel like I should comments um, with the AV systems, you know, for those that of us that uh, work in the industry, we've seen um, uh, varying levels of enthusiasm and questions of, of timing around exactly when uh, different levels of autonomous driving will arrive and at what scale. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's interesting to note that even kind of during the summer into the fall, um, multiple of the kind of rideshare oriented um, AV companies have actually uh, moved forward with pulling their safety drivers and starting to operate uh, systems, Waymo being one, um, and, there's, and there's others working down that path. So I, I certainly uh, believe that the time horizon is longer than maybe we would have thought two years ago, but this is also not a fully down the road thing either as some of these companies start to commercialize. So it's, it's right. good to know that that boot camp is out there. Yeah, absolutely. And to kind of add on to that too, we're hearing a lot from the EV space as well, right? So just making sure that we have courses that are um, fulfilling that need in the you know HEV and EV space. So we've got courses in that area as well, which is something that we've been seeing increasingly recently. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, Rachel, I want to come back to you because one of the things that intrigues me about the CEO group is, is you mentioned you were thinking about IT and auto and then kind of said, no, it translates across both worlds. Um, as you work with your constituent group, it's perhaps a little different than the rest of us in the sense that you maybe have energy or others. What, I guess, are there things that we can learn from how other industries are tackling these challenges uh, maybe other states, as some of us, you know, Stacy, for instance, you all have a, a footprint that's, you know, global. What else can we learn from how this conversation is unfolding outside of Michigan? And is there anything that we can, you know, proudly steal uh, and import here to, to move this conversation faster? And Michelle, certainly feel free to jump into, but I suspect Rachel and Stacy, uh, you guys have some unique insight here. Yeah, you know, we looked at a lot of other regions, and um, I think what was interesting is um, different regions have different challenges in terms of, um, you know, in some place, the workforce board may be just in one city, whereas the school system is run by the mayor's office and the community college system is a tri-county issue. So to make some of these regional things happen, it requires kind of different partners and pieces pulling things together to make um, all the gears turn well. Um, and so I think we know that Southeast Michigan and Detroit are not going to be the same as every other city, but we are going to need to think about where do our pieces and parts overlap in the right way and where do we need to build some additional kind of muscles to pull those things together. Um, we took a field trip down to Houston, where the Greater Houston Partnership has an amazing employer led workforce initiative that they've been um, working on for years and thinking about some of these issues across um, industries and training partnerships. And they have a petrochemical initiative there that is really amazing in the way um, employers work together. They had a huge work uh, employer short, employee shortage. And so decided to work together um, with their regional community college system to make sure that the curriculum was really well aligned, that they were really articulating career um, pathways to people. People didn't really understand the kinds of um, high paying opportunities. And if they did understand, they didn't know how to get started onto that laddered pathway. And so closing those gaps and making it a lot more seamless for residents and for the community college system has really led to them um, being able to scale those systems to more people enrolling in those programs. Um, and I think, you know, so much of what we saw there was, you know, there's certainly unique things about the petrochemical industry, but it was really the process and the partnership. And I think, you know, that's how we're thinking about this project is how do we sort of create that template and that process for one role, but then, um, that will help us figure out what are some of the other pieces and partners that we need to make sure that we can scale this and that it, um, once we kind of get that muscle built a little, it'll be easier to uh, scale across different industries and roles. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Stacy and Michelle, anything else on that? Um, I was just, I suppose, going to add um, one of the things as sort of Rachel was talking about the different pieces that kind of apply depending on the region. Um, I mean, because WIN is a, a regional organization and we do work with both our workforce boards and um, our community colleges and we operate in the city of Detroit, but all of its surrounding counties, including all the way up to Flint, it's I the the discussion sort of how you make something happen regionally is kind of one that we're dealing with every day because um, as far as mobility goes, it's definitely a regional initiative in Southeast Michigan, um, but to make sure that everyone is sort of having their interests represented depending on what region, what part of Southeast Michigan they're from is it definitely requires a lot of coordination and a lot of different um, parties at the table to make anything that you want to happen, happen. Yeah, just a ton of collaboration. Yes. Yeah, so um, just to kind of add to that, one of the things that, that we're able to see um, being that we do have more of a global presence, right? Um, we're always wanting to make sure we keep our finger on the pulse as to which sort of topics are important to which areas of the world. Um, one of the more recent areas that has really stuck out, um, there's a, a recent standard that came out um, with a partnership between ISO and SAE, uh, 21434, around road vehicles for cybersecurity. And we're finding that that's, um, that particular topic area is one that is res uh, resonating with a lot of different countries. And it's great because we're working on um, putting together a virtual offering to really be able to fulfill the need for those individual locations. That's a, a great example, Stacy, and, and I'm gonna but dig a little bit further on that one. Of if course. I'm one of these uh, transitioning workers and I'm not familiar with that ISO uh, cybersecurity standard, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about what that means and, and why that's kind of uh, setting the stage for a need for new training? Yeah, of course. So um, the, the previous standard we had around that topic area was J3061. And essentially they've decided to update the standard to really include, you know, um, tools to utilize to really make sure that these companies are implementing uh, cybersecurity um, across the board to make sure, you know, with, with the newer vehicles that we have in so many different pieces and parts that are really having to um, interact with, with the world of cybersecurity, wanting to make sure that when they're designing these parts and pieces that they have that in mind. And so this new standard that's out is really just um, kind of an, uh, it's, it's open to interpretation in some areas, but it really gives some specifics on how to implement the standard um, and how to implement these types of best practices. And it gives some tools and such. And so the goal for the training would be to really help to create more of a common language around the standard, um, some common universal tools to use as well, uh, just so everyone can be on the same page. That's great. Yes, certainly uh, more will be coming as these vehicles uh, become pervasively connected. Um, there's uh, some comments that we're receiving from a couple of participants that are recognizing and remembering some of the SAE standards that have been um, very uh, applicable or aligned to the technology that they were working on throughout their careers. So it's, it's fascinating, Stacey, to see that resonated here. I uh, love that. I love seeing that. I'm just digging in now. That's, yeah. that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I want to take the, take the discussion in a, a slightly different direction for a minute, which is a younger group of people. So all of us, we focus on adults, incumbent workers, those you may be entering the career, um, but you know, certainly uh, of, have at least reached the age of 18. Yet one of the things that we've certainly discovered at the Institute is um, if you envision your programs starting at 18 or even in high school, um, there's an opportunity missed in helping younger people see what some of these jobs actually look like and frankly, how cool they are. There's a, a real kind of lack of awareness in some cases of what these jobs even look like today, cybersecurity being a great example. So I'll throw it out to the group, um, knowing that most of us focus on adults and transitioning workers, 
is anyone doing anything as it relates to, you know, we kind of call the talent pipeline or engaging younger people and understanding their journey into this world? Yeah, uh, we just started. Um, so I don't know how many, I don't know if you're familiar, Jessica, or how many people on the call are familiar. Um, but for years, uh, Toyota had a program called the um, FAME AMT program, the Federation of Advanced Manufacturing Education Advanced Mechanical Technician, Mechatronic Technician. I always mess up the M, but um, the, the program actually starts um, fairly young. It was, they've had a lot of success with it, primarily um, in Kentucky and then several other Southern states uh, around, the, around the US. Um, they have different chapters all over the place. It's actually run by NAM now, so it's not specifically like exclusive to Toyota. Um, and they, but as far as um, Toyota is concerned, uh, they in particular uh, had quite a bit of success with it. And it starts, I believe, in fourth grade. Um, and it allows students to sort of learn about AMT as a possible career option. And they continue to learn about it all the way through middle school and all the way through high school to the point when they're in high school, they're sort of being dual educated. They're finishing their high school diploma, but they're also spending time like in a plant doing the work and getting certified so that when they graduate from high school, they have only a few more steps left to become a full AMT. Um, you know, it, it eliminates the, the question of student debt because you basically go straight from high school to working in a plant. Um, and one, when all of the other um, automotive companies that are a part of Magma sort of learned about this and its success uh, across the US in building a workforce um, for various companies and, you know, sort of specifically Toyota, um, there was a lot of interest from our members in potentially bringing a fame chapter to Michigan. That's not to say that it'll actually happen or um, that we're even beyond the initial discussion of we want a fame chapter, now what do we do? Um, but it is one of the things that we're talking about in our meetings and trying to figure out what kind of steps we can take to sort of bring that educational program here to Southeastern Michigan. I would add um, a lot of uh, my experience has been with youth and workforce, and I think there's a lot of amazing programs happening. I've been mostly Detroit specific, but we have um, the Detroit Promise, which is free college, and I know it's something the state's looking at. We have a huge summer jobs program. Our school district is looking at all kinds of dual enrollment and CTE opportunities, and um, the ability to sort of tie those things together for kids. Um, I sort of remember vaguely being 16 and 18, and if it's not a really clear cut path that makes it very clear what the next step is, um, I think it's really hard and kids might get excited by something and not know sort of how to turn that into some uh, career. And if they have um, fewer resources, whether it's, um, you know, we have really low or low numbers of college and career counselors in the school districts, um, specifically in Detroit, but Southeast Michigan in general, um, if the people who are advising kids, if their families aren't aware of all of those options, it makes it a lot harder for them to kind of take those steps. And I think the programs like FAME do a great job of making that, um, that it's not just the exposure and it's not just the skills, but it really ties those things together. And I think we have so many of those right pieces here that there's a huge opportunity to think about just mushing them all together in a way that makes it easier for kids to understand parents, counselors. Yeah, so to add to that, um, some of you may be familiar with a program that SAE offers called AWIM or A World in Motion. Uh, so it is actually a program that is dedicated to K through eight. And essentially we provide the curriculum and work with uh, schools and, and districts in the area and really all over the place. Um, we're always looking for volunteers. Uh, uh, for engineers to come on in and help us. So if you're interested in that, uh, please feel free to reach out and I can put you in contact with the right person. Um, but it's a really great program that really allows those students to, to dig in these, the, these great challenges that they give them to really think about mobility and advance their skills and knowledge and, and interest really is kind of the, the biggest um, the biggest goal with that is just to get them interested to see, you know, this is how we make and break things, right? And this is what you can do with it. And um, as a previous third grade teacher myself, um, I, it's, it's so wonderful at that age, they're just little sponges and they soak it all up. So if you have a chance to, to work with a whim or a world in motion, please do because it's a really great experience. And I think, you know, the engagement by those of us that are professionals in the industry helps in some ways to, to stem a bit of that gap in guidance counselors. And frankly, a guidance counselor couldn't 
possibly be expected to know all of the career paths that we're exposed to, but certainly just the additional hands on deck with these young people. Um, it was certainly one of the things that we've found, Stacey, I love the idea of, you know, hands on uh, make and break and, and just see how it works. The other thing we're seeing is around inspiration, um, particularly here in Southeast Michigan, engaging younger people from diverse backgrounds. I do, we've seen, and I personally do believe strongly, it's really important for um, for people of all ages, including young people, to see leaders and inspiring leaders that you know have maybe similar backgrounds and stories and, and can relate to them from a, a life experience. Um, and so that's one of the things that we <clears throat> worked on piloting this summer was to connect um, diverse leaders back to a, a pilot group of young people with a program called uh, Grow Detroit Young Talent, which creates um, internship opportunities for 18 to 24 year old. So um, really personally enjoyed the chance to do that, but also uh, saw it very clearly that through this inspiration and exposure to different future manufacturing technologies, as well as just where the industry is going, um, people all around us um, can actually realize that, that these jobs are right in our backyards. Um, I actually was speaking with someone uh, just earlier this week who works for um, one of the OEMs here in town. And she said, she does work with young people as well. And she shared, she was talking to someone recently and he said, I didn't even know uh, this company is still around anymore. And uh, there's a building with the very large logo of theirs uh, in the Detroit skyline. So uh, we should not take at all for granted um, <laughs> that people are aware of what we're all doing in this space. I think it's, it's a really good point. And I think it's also frankly very energizing Right, you speak to young people being sponges. It's uh, for whether you've been in this industry for a while, uh, it's also nice to plug back in with young people. Yeah, definitely. Um, and to just quick add to that, I know initially the goal or the question was um, younger folks under 18, but we do also have our collegiate design series as well through SAE. Uh, which of course is at the collegiate level. Um, we've got some really great challenges that they put the students through. Um, there's the auto drive challenge, formula SAE, you know, formula hybrid. So there's a lot of different ways that we really try to, um, to incorporate the students into learning more about mobility. That's great. Um, uh, I'm taking a look at our chat here. Uh, there's an active discussion uh, burgeoning around apprenticeships. Um, people are so curious, Michelle, I think your, your fame example really um, hit, hit a nerve there in the sense that it's a program for the, if anyone's done an apprenticeship, uh, it seems to me that they can speak very personally to how it helped them launch their career. But here in the US, maybe unlike Europe and other places, we're just not as exposed to apprenticeships anymore. So the couple questions here around, you know, are they even a thing anymore? Um, do they work? Um, does anyone want to, maybe Michelle, I'll throw it back to you with fame, this apprenticeship structure, but anyone else want to comment on that? Sure, um, I'm happy to talk probably at length, maybe too long about apprenticeships. Um, so when does, an enormous amount with apprenticeships. Um, I personally have done an enormous amount with apprenticeships. Um, the Back when I used to work at the state of Michigan, I published a report on apprenticeships in the state of Michigan uh, using data from the uh, federally held data resource on apprenticeships. Um, so apprenticeships are, to answer your first question, apprenticeships are definitely a thing. Um, they're not quite as widespread or um, I wanna say, well known um, to the general public uh, as they are in, uh, as you said, a lot of European countries, Germany, the United Kingdom. Um, but we actually have a really pretty good program here in Michigan. Um, we currently have 53 occupations available for apprenticeship in the state of Michigan, um, several of which are IT and uh, advanced manufacturing, but several others that are healthcare oriented, um, graphic design, 
Um, so there's there's a lot of different options. And um, to be to be clear to everyone who's on this webinar, any occupation is apprenticeable. Um, if you want to be an actor, or if you want to be a jewelry maker, or if you want to even be a researcher like myself, you can technically apprentice in the occupation. In fact, uh, Wynn has um, started everyone we hire now that comes in through our doors um, actually gets apprenticed to someone higher up in the organization. So we run our own apprenticeships um, because on the job training, even for occupations that require a bachelor's degree is still invaluable. Um, so uh, Wynn currently has two federally held grants um, that focus on apprenticeship in the state of Michigan. Um, and in this particular region. Um, and we just were awarded a third actually to expand upon one of our earlier two. Um, so we're doing a lot of work in this area uh, specific to advanced manufacturing. Um, as far as your question about being worth it, I can definitely also tell you that it is. Um, one of the grants actually paid for uh, Win, primarily myself to uh, build an apprenticeship return on investment calculator. Um, it's available to the public. Um, I can tell you it's on our apprenticeship website, which is MI Apprenticeship, so Michigan Apprenticeship.org, and it's under employers on the drop down, and you just click ROI calculator. Um, and the way that the calculator works is uh, it takes into account a bunch of different wage and cost information. Um, and basically, uh, you pick an occupation, so electrician, um, you tell the calculator how much money that you pay your electrician and how much it costs you to train the electrician, and then it spits out a number and tells you what your return on investment is. If you don't know that information, um, it has averages for the state of Michigan in there, so it'll put the average wages for electrician apprentices, the average cost for training, and it'll spit out an average ROI. Um, but if you work in the Upper Peninsula, you might pay differently than if you work in Detroit, so we made it adjustable on the front end for employers who might be all over the state. Um, and we just got some money to update it. So um, that's one of the things I'll be working on in the coming months is getting new wages, new average wages, and thinking about ways to adapt the calculator. Because uh, I based it on a model out of the United Kingdom, and it's pretty accurate for advanced manufacturing occupations, but a little less accurate for newer occupations like IT and healthcare. So I just I want to make some tweaks to it moving forward. Um, so that's that's like I guess the short version of apprenticeship. I could go on for the rest of this <laughs> webinar about it, but I won't do that to everyone. So no, that's great, Michelle. And um, one of the other things I'll call out for the group um, that there's some activity related to is the um, CTA, uh, which is the group basically behind the CES. Um, uh, event that happens in Las Vegas every year, the Consumer Technology Association. Um, they have also launched an apprenticeship coalition. And one of the things that's exciting about that group is, um, you know, it's, it's focused on federally registered programs, but it takes some of the apprenticeships that have been developed in, uh, you know, call it high tech. Uh, IBM and places like that. And we have local employers that are a participant in that coalition. So Ford and Bosch, which are partners of ours. And so there's also this nice mixing that's happening between industry segments. And again, this idea of borrowing and learning from one another. Uh, so there's certainly some big names on that group, but I think Michelle, to your point, uh, pretty much anything is apprenticeshipable. Um, and you don't have to be a big company to think about building that into your training programs. I would add um, some of our employers are really interested in that CTA IBM New Collar Apprenticeship. Um, and I think it's really exciting that some of them participate are thinking about participating in it and are at different phases and some have not, but are potentially interested. And there's a lot of value from employers hearing from other employers that have done it. Um, to Michelle's point, it's not as common in Southeast Michigan, certainly more in automotive, I think, than a lot of other industries, but it can be really helpful to um, share some of that knowledge from people who are participating and getting that value from it. And you don't have to be young to do an apprenticeship. Great no. for transitioning in a career. Yeah, I think that's another key misnomer about apprenticeships. Um, really great discussion in the chat. We'll call out again. Great uh, chance to throw your questions or experiences in there. Some reconnections being made uh, in the chat, which is very cool. Uh, please use the Q&A as well. We only have a few minutes left. Um, I want to um, 
I guess ask the question that nearly always has to be asked in these webinars and sessions these days, given that we're sitting here remotely um, with the opportunity to work from home, which is the COVID question. Uh, we, some of us have already touched on it in the sense that it's, it's created, um, you know, perhaps some temporary layoffs, transitions for others. Um, but it also means that many people do have an opportunity to do some remote work and certainly remote learning. Um, so it's really a two part question under the COVID umbrella and I'll just throw it out to the group to react to. The first is when we think about workforce development and training, so much of the way these programs have been structured is the, the dollars flow through a state and a set of state workforce agencies. And it's always functioned before because if you're sitting here in Detroit or in, in Lansing uh, and you are trained, you're gonna work within a certain geographic radius more than likely. Um, but with remote work, one of the things that we know now is that employers have been able to expand the geography that they're recruiting from, potentially outside of Michigan. And so it changes the landscape for job seekers, but frankly, the employers themselves. So I guess I'm curious on that front, does anything change in your minds uh, with the way programs are structured or dollars flow to reflect the fact that there's perhaps more geographic flexibility than we've had before? And then the second question goes back to training. Uh, what sticks with us post COVID vaccine uh, as we're all hopefully able to do more work in person together. Uh, oh, go ahead, Rachel. <laughs> I have just one nice thing that I, um, one of the sort of technology training programs we've worked with, their first cohort was I think all but one person were male. And one of the challenges they said was the childcare flexibility that um, because it's a short-term program, people weren't able to sort of rearrange their childcare to do the training without the job on the other side. And then since COVID they started and they're doing an asynchronous online learning with just like a small element of um, in class time. And they have, I think half women. And so um, certainly there's additional childcare challenges and other issues brought upon by COVID, but I thought what a great um, learning from that to think about how some of these programs might serve people in different ways that we wouldn't have explored otherwise. Yeah, um, I was going to add, so Magma does courses for incumbent employees, um, but we're not the course provider. We contact, we contract with course providers to sort of, you know, match them with the employers. Um, one of our course providers is SAE, and um, we have all of our course providers um, have virtual options um, for their courses, which has been great during the pandemic um, so that, you know, employees still have access to education and training. Should, they, should their employer want or need to enroll them. Um, but what's been interesting um, is that I uh, have found, at least in my conversations with our employers, that our mobility employers, um, is that I think that there's potentially gonna be a shift to more virtual training long-term from this, um, just because it's, as sort of Rachel touched upon, a lot easier um, logistically for everyone involved to sort of, sort of choose a uh, virtual tract and then get the education and training that they need from that. Um, it doesn't require as much coordination or like six people having to be in a room to make the class happen um, to sort of make the cost effective for the employer and also for the education provider. It's it, everything just goes down when you make it virtual. And so I think there's more interest. I think long term, there's going to be more interest in education and training through these more cost efficient um, options of providing it. Yeah, so to Michelle's point, I mean, obviously, um, pre-COVID, we really did want to expand our e-learning options, right? I would say uh, COVID definitely accelerated that. So, um, you know, we took uh, the majority of our courses, to Michelle's point, and um, transitioned them to live virtual offerings in some cases, um, which, you know, Jessica, your initial question, how, how does this change? with more folks working remote, I think that's exactly how it changes, right? This idea that we can reach so many more people now through these virtual trainings and just making sure that there's still 
as hands-on as they can be, right? Making sure you're incorporating um, case studies into it, uh, challenging questions, um, making sure you're doing, uh, there's the option of like a flipped classroom model where you can send videos and podcasts ahead of time and then really dig into the deep, rich conversations during the training itself. Um, so I, I think to kind of answer that question overall, over, providing more virtual options is going to be something that's important for us moving forward. It does help with the scalability and allows more folks to attend. Um, but I also think that really focusing on how to make those virtual offerings just as engaging as in-person offerings is really important to us. And it's something that um, we've really been able to dig into this year and get really creative with, which is exciting. And so I think we'll see a lot of that stick around even after um, COVID passes. That's great. Um, and there's a question uh, from Stan here, uh, kind of poking at the economics here of, of training and how money flows about um, income tax. And it, you know, depending on where you work, does the state of Michigan, for instance, benefit um, if, if you work remotely or if a Michigan company hires someone remotely. Um, and I would say it, it's, it's not that simple. Um, and if you've ever filled out a multi-state income tax return, you know that the federal government likes to know where you spent most of your time. Um, and there's actually some interesting articles out there in the press right now about these so-called digital nomads that packed everything into a van and you know, have been working from a campsite uh, at Yosemite National Park, and they're facing some interesting income tax challenge questions now. So while it's not that simple, I think one of the other interesting considerations here as a state looks at its programs is in economic development, uh, there's a calculation that's often used for certain types of jobs, and there's data behind it, which shows that this type of job um, traditionally drives this number of additional jobs and types of jobs in the region. So think about an office building. It has a coffee shop and a restaurant and a lawyer's office nearby. Those are connected to the economic activity happening in that building. If we all go remote, and if some of us work from a different state part of the time, those calculations are different. And so the ROI that a state traditionally has used to decide how much it's going to invest in all kinds of programs, potentially training included, um, that math changes. And so I think that there will be, if this continues to be a trend, uh, there's some additional work and, and reckoning needed to figure out what this really means for our programs, but frankly, you know, to bigger scale, what it means for communities and, you know, how we collaborate and, and have maybe communities of practice for learning. Okay, perfect. Um, one of the questions that I saw came through the chat was a question around how employers can sustainably plan to support their employees in their learning journeys. Um, so I'll throw it out to the group, any best practices? And then what I would love to do as we start to wrap to closing is share a current program that the state of Michigan has to actually make funding available. So funding is certainly a question, but any other best practices that you've seen working with your employers to make this something that's lasting, not just a temporary Band-Aid that tries to solve training in a short term? Um, yeah, I can start. I can tell you um, the way that we approach it because we have 10 employers that we work with. Um, they all, agree on a, a, a set of needs, whether it's um, soft skills, program management, embedded controls, whatever it is, um, they agree on a set of needs and we uh, solicit proposals for education providers to give courses in those areas. And then if a employee from Nissan decides to take a course in um, systems engineering, they receive a certificate that's recognized by all 10 companies in our consortium. So if that person leaves Nissan and moves over to Ford, that course is still recognized by Ford. Um, and so that's 
been a really, I think, interesting way of approaching this problem, especially as you think about like a, an employee's journey. Um, all of the employers were seeing the same issues across their employees and like where the needs were for upskilling. And so by agreeing to recognize the upskilling done across the industry, it's made all of the employees sort of equally educated and equally valuable to all of the companies. I think um, similar perhaps to Michelle, it's some, I've seen some interesting um, cohort based programs that I think, you know, we all know most of the professional development dollars available don't get taken advantage of by employees and some of these really strategic cohort programs where they'll maybe offer um, like a customer service representative group a an opportunity to um, take four hours once a week where they still get paid but are also in a program to upskill in um, digital talent or to move to a different uh, portion of the company has been really beneficial both um, to sort of fill hard to fit companies and you know you already have that invested dollar in the employee and having a group is more likely to have um, employees participate and complete. Yeah, and to add to um, what both Michelle and Rachel had shared, I think one best practice that I think is is something that we see often with companies. Um, on occasion, it's a struggle, uh, but making sure that each of your employees, as best you can, depending on the size of your company, has a clear learning path to move forward, right? So once you identify what needs there are, once you do, whether it be, you know, gap analysis, if you have the um, the resources for that, but just in general, once you identify needs, the overall needs, working with and, and ideally sitting down with that employee to say, um, where are you now and where is it you want to be? And let's work together to create a learning path to get you there, right? So perhaps it's working with one training provider um, where you can say, okay, they want to do this course, this course, and this course in, in this order. Um, or perhaps it's numerous training providers. But at the end of the day, just giving them a clear pa uh, path forward, I think is a really great best practice to follow. Mm -hmm. That's great. And there's a question that just came in around um, some of the online, the um, MOOC, you know, Coursera, Udacity type programs. Absolutely, we're seeing employers utilize those as well as employees in a self-directed way use them. Uh, I personally have uh, absolutely used Coursera to make a career pivot. Um, I would just say, you know, what we found in our interviews with employers is they're not all created equally. Some are truly fantastic. Some are very lightweight. And so, you know, I think it's, it's worth some diligence around the programs. Do you get course credit or not? Do you get a certificate or not? Um, but certainly this is a space, I'm sure, we're all watching very closely. Um, so I mentioned uh, potentially uh, an, another way to make <laughs> some of this training sustainable, which is funding. You know, all of the, all of you can do good work bringing employers together to the table, um, leveraging grants and things. Um, but sometimes, even when there's a will, uh, that little bit of budget can go a long way in making um, uh, training actually available. So. For, for everyone here on the call, um, one of the things we, we definitely wanted to share as a group today is a funding source that is actually available right now here in Michigan. Uh, if you're in the workforce development training world, you've probably received a presentation from uh, the state a number of times now on it, but if you are a manager or a technical worker, uh, this is something that um, we thought you should be aware of too, because you can actually work with your company and your HR team to put together um, a, a request for this funding. So the program is uh, the Going Pro Michigan um, program, and it's run through a group of agencies called Michigan Works. And uh, they're the actual uh, ones putting together uh, and vetting the funding requests. So Rachel, Michelle, um, Stacy, I, Dexter, we can certainly help get you to the right Michigan Works agency, but you, you do need to work directly with them. Um, and so the idea in this talent fund is that these are uh, competitive awards. So you have to submit an application for employers to fund training, development, uh, excuse, me, excuse me, development, and retention efforts for both new employees, but frankly, um, current employees as well. Uh, and this is really focused on what are the skills that you need 
to perform your job or the job that you're transitioning into. So there's a focus on specific skills. Um, and again, what might it enable you to, to focus on from a promotion? Um, the hope is that um, you do pursue uh, something with an industry recognized credential, Michelle, like you mentioned, Stacy, and, and you know, even what we're working on. And it's transferable. So it's not one employer, it's not necessarily one industry, it's something that can stay with you for the longer run. Um, so the state is actually uh, making $1,500 per person available for classroom or customized training. Um, and for new employees, there's some similar funding available. And then back to that question about apprenticeships, um, if it's a federally registered apprenticeship program, there's funding for up to $3,000 for participation by an employee in that program. Um, the grants are available to Michigan employers of all sizes. They're hoping that small and medium-sized businesses will take advantage of this. Um, and again, these are dollars that are available right here in the state. So whether it's an IT skill, a technical skill, um, maybe your entire company is transitioning and learning a new set of technology, perhaps moving to cloud-based um, solutions, uh, there are both programs available and funding as well to help you make that transition. So please let any of us know if we can be of help making an introduction to you for yourself, your organization. Do you know that your employer is the one that has to submit the application? So you'll need to work with you know, your boss, your HR team and the like, but um, technical leaders can certainly be the ones that bring up this need internally. And so I see we're already at time. I suspect all of us could continue to talk about this for you know at least another hour. But I really do wanna thank uh, the, the panelists here. Thank you all ladies for joining me for this discussion today. I know each of you personally, I know this is a huge passion of yours and I love um, that you, you know, bring this energy to making this industry ready. Uh, for the future and creating this pathway for, for those that will be taking this training. Um, I wanna call out a couple of things here. We at the Institute will continue to host uh, future panels like this one uh, over you know, the next couple months. We'll take a break for the holidays, but we'll be back in January for a conversation looking at questions around the internet, digital inclusion and mobility, certainly an important topic that's on top of mind for a lot of us. And I would encourage everybody to stay in touch with us, with our partners here, with the SE Detroit section online in whatever medium you prefer, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for future events and other interesting news. So we'll see you all digitally, stay safe, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Thank Bye.